inviting me here today. It's been a fascinating conference, and I'm honored to be speaking today. Um, I'm Amelia, the research manager at the Hong Kong Heritage Project. Uh, this is my 10th year working for the project. Um, two of the last have been spent working remotely in London, whilst undertaking a PhD in the archive sources. In today's presentation, I'll be introducing the work of the Heritage Project and using case studies to illustrate the importance of the archive for the public, as well as for our internal business stakeholders. I'll also be introducing the archival landscape in Hong Kong and exploring some of the reasons why corporate archives are so important. In doing so, I hope to touch on the future role of business archives in the city. I'd like to start my presentation by providing a brief background on the Heritage Project itself. Although we have a very all-encompassing name, made perhaps more confusing by the fact that the Hong Kong History Project and the Hong Kong Memory Project have recently been inaugurated, we are in fact the archive of the Kaduri family and their business and charitable entities. Um, the Kaduri family first came to Hong Kong from Baghdad in 1880, and since that time they've been intimately involved in Hong Kong's commercial life, such as the utilities, hospitality and property sectors. Lord Kaduri, who you can see above there in his robes, um, was also the first Hong Kong-born citizen to be made a peer by Margaret Thatcher, no less. And so our collections are very varied and provide a glimpse into Hong Kong's business, political and social development in the 20th century. We were founded in 2007, and since that time, we've acquired 150 linear meters of records from numerous Kuduri business entities and charities. We provide archival services to our internal corporate stakeholders, as well as access to the general public. The archive is also home to over 500 oral history interviews uh, recorded with members of the public on Hong Kong history topics, such as uh, the Japanese occupation, the 1967 riots, Chinese and Jewish refugees, and the 1997 handover of Hong Kong. We also record oral histories with former employees of the businesses. Um, as we heard yesterday, oral histories is quite important to diversify holdings. Since the archive's inception, there's been a desire by our senior management, um, who is Sir Michael Kaduri, the son of Lord Kaduri, um, to record the stories of Kaduri business employees, whilst also acting to preserve the memory of Hong Kong and we're now the largest oral history repository in the city. We aim to provide access to a wide and diverse audience, taking into consideration age, academic interest, and geographic location. We believe that archival access comes in many forms, and over the past 10 years, this has included uh, 12 public exhibitions in partnership with government museums, such as the Hong Kong History Museum, um, that have attracted 700,000 visitors in total, uh, regular education programs for university students, high school students, and acad academics, including oral history projects and um, seminars on archives. Uh, we also have regular publications, um, corporate histories, and a quarterly newsletter, which is available on our website. We also have um, a dedicated website. You can see some screenshots here. Um, this provides access to um, a selection of digitized materials, our online catalog, oral history clips. Um, finally, but perhaps most importantly, our repository provides access to members of the public by appointment. I now want to turn to talk a little bit about the business archives landscape in Hong Kong. Um, you can see our archivist there, Mr. Clement Chung, and some of the, hold the business holdings that we have in the archive, which are all Kaduri business interests. When the Heritage Project was founded in 2007, there was only, only one other corporate archive in Hong Kong, and that, is, that was and is the HSBC archive, which was established in the region in 2004, and that's still the benchmark for, for business archives excellence in Hong Kong. Um, many of Hong Kong's so-called Hongs, such as Swire and Jardine Matheson, had already deposited their collections in universities across Britain rather than in Hong Kong. 
But over the past 10 years, business archives have grown exponentially to include Deacons, a law firm which donated its collection to the University of Hong Kong, Miney Live, Jebsons and Swire, which opened a new Asia-Pacific branch in Hong Kong. These new archives, as well as smaller family-run entities, not necessarily open to the public, um, have developed hand-in-hand -hand with government-funded museum complexes and built heritage sites, which are run along public and private lines. Business archives have played an important role in raising awareness about the value of archives in Hong Kong. For instance, business archivists serve on the board of the Hong Kong Archive Society, and it was through a collaboration of business archives, ourselves included, that Hong Kong celebrated its first International Archives Day in 2012. And I'm now pleased to say it's a regular event in Hong Kong. These archives are an invaluable research resource for historians. The Japanese occupation of Hong Kong in 1941 to 1945 saw the destruction of thousands of government records, um, which often necessitates a reliance on overseas archives for researchers. Hong Kong is also one of the only places in the world not to have an archival law, which signals a potential problem in the preservation of government records for the future. And so, in a place where business has played such an important historic role in the development of the city, I think that business archives and private collections have a really important role to play in plugging memory, memory gaps in Hong Kong's historical memory. Um, I now want to turn to two of our collections to give an example as to how our archive serves both the community and our corporate stakeholders. The first is the Hong Kong and Shanghai Hotels. Um, you may have heard of the Peninsula Hotel Group. The Peninsula Hotel recently opened in, in Paris and there's Peninsula Hotels around the world. And the Hong Kong and Shanghai Hotels is the holding company of, of the pen. Um, it started operation in 1866 and the Kuduri family first invested in the company in the early 1900s and now holds a controlling stake. As you can see, the collection consists of um, beautiful architectural drawings, vintage luggage labels, and, and as well as minute books from the 1880s. The collection has a very high corporate value. Um, it's provided stories and anecdotes for Chairman Speeches, who's Sir Michael Kaduri, so we often mine the archive looking for historical tidbits to put into his speeches. Um, it's provided educational material for um, the hotel staff for lunch and learn sessions, which we put on by ourselves. Um, and it's also provided the backbone for corporate history books on the hotel company, the most recent being a tradition well served by the historian Peter Hibbard. In terms of its um, community value, the collection, as you can see, is very pretty and it's been used in a number of um, third-party public exhibitions, such as at the University Museum and Art Gallery and the Hong Kong History Museum. The second example is um, the Kaduri Agricultural Aid Association, um, which was a charity founded by the Kaduri brothers in Hong Kong in 1951 uh, to provide interest-free loans, tools and livestock for refugee farmers. Today, the farm is still in existence, but its mandate has changed. Um, it has a new mission for environmental sustainability. There's not many farmers in Hong Kong today. In terms of um, the corporate value that we can give to um, the Kaduri farm, as you can see from the picture, um, we were asked to appraise and acquire 5,000 case files of KAAA farmers, which were found in a chicken coop um, on the farm and which are now safely placed in our repository, as you can see below. So, as well as um, providing archival services for this Kaduri charity, preserving their records, we've also undertaken uh, legal research for them and provided materials for internal exhibitions for their staff. Um, this collection has a very, very high public value. Uh, it's very popular with researchers keen to use new resources, new sources of information on Hong Kong's post-war agricultural development and it's already resulted in one book and contributed to a lot of postgraduate research. We also launched an oral history program to preserve the history of these former refugees too. So some conclusions. Um, as I've spoken in my presentation, more and more business archives are opening to the public in Hong Kong, or at least hiring an archivist to professionally manage their collections for the future. As I've mentioned, this is important as business archives can and do play a key role in the preservation of a city's heritage. But how can this be maximized? 
Well, the first is increased access. We found that um, members of the public still don't know about a lot of business archives available in the city or about our collections. We believe that outreach is a really valuable tool and social media can increase the reach and awareness of uh, business archive collections for free. So that's always a bonus. Um, as we heard yesterday, digitization is important, but it's not a cure-all. I went to a conference in, in London recently where a speaker lamented that archives are now a place to raid rather than a place to think. And as well as a privacy issue for, for business archives, I think that's very apt. However, we feel that selective digitization does provide an important taster of collections. We do have some digitized records on our website, especially for researchers coming from overseas, which they have done to use our collection. Business archive networks, for example, the Business Archives Group of the Hong Kong Archives Society, which was founded in 2010, um, has been really crucial in providing support and knowledge sharing, as well as encouragement to other businesses thinking of launching their own archive. Similarly, public-private cultural partnerships are very beneficial, as both parties have something to offer, and it's, and it's um, something that we've done a lot at the Heritage Project. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening, and please do check us out online and on our social media. Thank you. Questions for Amelia? I'll start off with one, because uh, the Kaduri family is in its third generation or fourth generation? Uh, yes, third yeah. generation, yes. Um, and with all family businesses, it comes a question of how much of the company archives are they and how much of the family archives are they? Have you reflected on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think at the beginning of our project, uh, we collected mainly archives from the family. Um, and I think the line is quite blurred because um, the holding company is Sir Ellie Kaduri and Sons, but there's also a lot of private correspondence. Uh, and within that private correspondence, it was correspondence with friends who were also business partners. Um, but as the, as the project and the archive has developed and we've gained traction, uh, we were able to acquire um, new archives from different businesses, so Kaduri Estates, um, which is a property development company, the hotels. So I think we got the, the old minute books in 2010 and the charities as well. So the, the Kaduri farm, which you saw, that was about 2014 that we got the case files. Great. Questions? Tim? So you mentioned that uh, you have oral histories as a big uh, component uh, of your archival collection. Uh, is it just the transcripts that you hold in, or do you also have the video uh, copy as well that is accessible? Yes, um, we are quite unique in that we film all of our oral histories, and um, depending on the consent form and uh, the wishes of the interviewee, um, so the, the transcript is kept in the archive, we write a synopsis, and the DVD copy is, is also kept in the archive too, so researchers can access the film as well as the transcript. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Amelia. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.